Let's see a couple of people I recognize. If you guys want to unmute yourselves, we're, we can go around and, uh, and do a round of introductions. And if everybody could just say um, your name and what operating system you use. And if you use a, a command line environment, what shell, what shell do you use? I guess I'll start. <laughs> My name is Matt. I work for esteemed.io. I'm uh, the esteemed director of screening. My primary uh, workstation environment is Linux, although I do have Linux, Mac, and Windows on my desk at all times. Um, so on Linux and Mac, I use uh, Z Shell. And on Windows, I use, uh, I believe I, it's Bash that comes with the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, although sometimes I just use git bash as well. My name is Len Lambert. Um, I have a Windows 10 machine. I'm using uh, WSL2 and so it's Linux and Ubuntu running on that. I'm Adrian McKee. I use uh, Linux and I use uh, Z shell. I'm Jack Franks for Drupal. My primary development environment is uh, a Mac, and uh, I've got iTerm and Fish, and I've got that set up pretty reasonably. But then I also have to do .NET stuff, so I've got Windows for that, and I'm entirely Git Bash for that, uh, and some PowerShell. Mm. I'm Rodney Little. I, I use a Mac. I use the basic terminal. I do use Git Bash sometimes as well. Uh, hi, I am Ralph, and uh, I'm on a Mac, and currently still using Bash. Good old Bash. Is that everybody who who wants to talk? I feel like there's just a couple other people. I see Matt Pritchard from uh, from yeah. Steam, but I don't know if you do you use the command line. You're, you're, yeah, 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 yeah. Movies are welcome. Yeah, yeah, I use Mac and then a uh, command line sometimes basically just CDLS, CDLS until I find what I need. I use it the other day to spin up uh, uh, Vue.js Vue project. So I installed Node or NPM install. So I got uh, some good experience there. It's been a little while since I've had to actually dig into terminal, but it, it's fun whenever I do. I always feel uh, like I'm using the matrix or trying to get in there. <laughs> you know, I, I can't imagine what it must be like at a really, really, really high level. It must be kind of fun. Yeah, I started out as a, as a Linux system administrator back in the 1990s. But I just remember when I was a kid, I had a Commodore 64 and I used to play those Zork games, the text adventures. And when I first got like my first shell account on a Linux system, I was like, I just felt like I, I should just, you know, I didn't know what to type. I was like, I wanted to be like, you know, use the bronze key in the wooden door or what, you know, like the things that you would type to solve a puzzle in, in these old text adventures. Light lamp, uh, you know? So I felt like that was just kind of the adventure began with that. And I, I just had to figure out what, what commands to type to kind of unlock all the puzzles that lay ahead. So. So yeah, uh, does anybody want to volunteer like what, what command line tools are essential to your day-to-day -day workflow? I'm using DDEV a lot. Excellent. Yeah, I use DDEV and Landau, so, um, but of course, Git. Um, uh, What's the new GH one? Oh, there yes. a GitHub command line. Yeah, I haven't yeah. used that yet. I've been meaning to try that out. I I use GitHub command line on my Windows machine. It's it's pretty nice. Lando for life though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do both WordPress and Drupal development, so either Lando or DDEV. I understand that. Solve the issue. <laughs> DDEV was my first love. And uh, actually, uh, I was in Mike Agnello's, one of his uh, training seminars uh, three or four years ago. And it was, it was really inspiring to get through there and, and like it. Uh, 
it's a really good tool. I can't say that I use one or the other. I use pretty much everything. Pantheon's Terminus command line and all that good stuff. Yeah. And of course, there's also, um, what am I thinking? Oh, someone else, go ahead. I'm blanking right now. Oh, Drush and Composer. Yes. Yes. All at a, at a Drupal event, how could, what would we do without Drush? Absolutely. But when I started using Composer, I had to remember not to enable or not to load modules via Drush to use Composer instead and then use Drush to enable them. <laughs> yeah. that, that was a little shift I had to remember. Yeah, it, it's a far fetch from uh, right clicking and saving the URL for the zip file and pasting it into the uploader, man. Drupal 7, man. That's how I used to roll. Well, remember downloading it and then yeah. unzipping it on your desktop and then uh, taking that folder and putting it into uh, the Drupal. FTP, yeah, FTP days, totally. I have to admit, it yeah. took me a long time. I forgot to mention Composer as well. And I was I was one of those hesitant ones to leave the FTP steps. But I'm still learning. I, I still have a lot to learn about Composer and all those commands. Well, it never stops. It never stops. Once you get command line, you're going to be like, what else can I do with the command line? Can I turn the lights off in my house with the command line? Yes. Probably. <laughs> Someone had come up with a way to play your Spotify via the command line. I tried doing it on my Mac and I couldn't, couldn't uh, solve it. But Actually, that's the only way to use Spotify if you're using BSD for your OS. They don't even have a, a client. It's a, There's a command line interface for Spotify and it uses Spotify.d, I think, as the library so that your, your computer uh, recognizes your computer as a playable device but there's no interface and so the only interface is, is a, a command line interface for spotify which is kind of funny i've tried to use uh, slack uh, command line in linux and i just got, kind of gave up <laughs> i used to listen to music uh you know instead of with a, a graphical uh player i would have like all my whatever, all my CDs that I ripped just in folders and I would just use M player, which is actually a video player, but has right. really this command line thing and I could like queue up playlists and stuff. It was, you know, or I would just uh, tell it to like, you know, play all the files in the directory with like an asterisk and have it just like one after the other it would play all the songs or you could have it do like, um, you know, you, you can even pipe things to it. So like you do like find all the files in this, all these nested directories and like <laughs> them to XARGs and pipe them to the player, you know, it's kind of crazy. Just leave that running in another window. I don't do that so much anymore. Man, I used to play with Winamp. <laughs> I remember Winamp too, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I use it to test, uh, Sometimes I use it to test whether I've got wine working right because it's like the only uh, it's a it's a pretty safe bet that you can get Win app to run in Linux <laughs> with yeah. wine. So like when I'm testing out uh, anything that I want to run in Linux that's Windows, I'm like, oh, will it play Win app? Okay, cool. We'll start from there. That's funny. Uh, well, let me think about this here. I, I, I heard somebody say they use fish and I have not used that one yet. I've been, I switched to Z shell about maybe four years ago and I was just won over immediately by the, uh, just all the plugins for it and all the aliases. And I found especially, you know, you shouldn't come to rely on this, but with the, with the Git plugin, I found that suddenly I just was so fast. <laughs> Everything that I did was just like, you know, um, GP to push something or GL to pull or, you know, um, and I have a couple of aliases of my own. I, I use one that's GPUP, which is like when there isn't um, an upstream branch yet and you have to create it so you can push to it. Like I wrote a little one-liner for that. 
So, uh, you know, um, I, I've heard good things about fish. I think, did that come after Z shell and then, and, uh, and, and some of its features were pulled back to Z shell or? I'm not really sure. Fish is new to me. I've been a Z shell user for a few years now. I've not tried fish. I'll have to check that out. I think somebody in the comments is uh, is is saying perhaps that they think ZSH has POSIX support, but I don't think it actually is fully POSIX compliant. I think that like if you're really looking for that, you should stick with Bash, um, or you know SH or whatever you know. But uh, it's I find it to be a better like I would use Bash for. Um, shell scripts and things that are part of server maintenance or DevOps and deploys and stuff like that. But I just find that these interactive shells like Z shell or fish are really, really good for an interactive environment where you're actually working and getting your work done. You don't necessarily have to worry so much about portability to different systems. Unless you're like me and then you get deep into theming your Z shell, then productivity goes right out the window. And I'm like, hmm, can I make this look like the matrix <laughs> yeah no I, I like that though the, the plugins are fantastic for z show and i've barely even begun to scratch the surface so lee would you put japanese in your in your terminal there <laughs> like the yeah, matrix? just let it run down the back you can see my terminal but not read anything and i'm just like code reader like oh i, I totally know what's going on yeah no it's a I, I, I like Z Shell for that. There's a an app called uh, Hyper.js that's a pretty cool uh, shell. It's fully, let me see. I think it's Hyper.js. I may be wrong. Yes, Hyper.is, I'm sorry, is the name of it. Uh, I'll post it in chat. It's an electron based. Um, terminal and works with Z shell, works on Mac OS, Windows, Debian, Fedora, and other Linux distros. And uh, it's cool because it actually has style sheets and stuff that you can like 100% customize your, your shell. I use it, I use it quite a bit. There you go. That's uh, that's for you if you really are. Uh, you want your uh, terminal to look like the matrix. That's what you did there. C matrix is an ASCII screensaver that will take over your uh, terminal with the matrix. So. That's a lot of fun. But you... <laughs> well, that's interesting. Mac OS changed to Z shell with Catalina. That's cool, Karen. Yes, I have heard that. You're the you're the second person to mention that. To me. Yeah, because I was I was talking to somebody else uh, about that just the other day. They they were mentioning you know what shell they were using that because uh, they thought it was Bash and uh, and they were on a Mac and they were like, oh my gosh, it's actually Z shell and they changed it. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, I totally will read that. Thank you for that, Karen. I haven't used my Mac in a in a in a while, so I'll have, to, I'll have to look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's cool. I'm using a vendor supplied machine right now for the contract that I'm on, so my Mac doesn't get a whole lot of love right now. I'm gonna see if I can send another uh, link to myself here, just to paste it into the sidebar. This is an article that I that I have um, shared many many times here. I get it. I had to slack it from one computer to another so I can paste it into the Zoom chat. Here we go. Copy link. Matt, do you have any good uh, cheat sheets for Composer? I'm sure you're going to get into some things like that as well. For Composer, um, mm -hmm. that's not what I just sent. Was uh, was sort of like an ultimate guide to your terminal makeover, which is geared toward Mac OS people. But um, but for Composer, I mean, I would just if I ever got stuck, you know, I, I would just Google like Composer this or that, or I would go to um, 
if I'm really, really stuck, I end up going to the, uh, to the composer channel on Drupal Slack, which is where a lot of people hang out who actually write this stuff, you know, and really, really know it well. Um, but Google avails, you know, and, and composers got pretty good documentation on its own. I'm not sure in terms of take a, cheat sheet. Take a look. Um, Mike Anello has a, over the course of the last month, um, I, um, several talks about how to get the most out of Composer, and that is basically a cheat sheet. So that I would go for. Just watch on Drupal TV one or two of his talks. Okay, thank you, Rob. Yeah, Mike is great. I find, let me think what, what else, because like, you know, everything, there's always new things that come out, but then you also, you, you get stuck in the things that you, you, once you learn a thing, if it helps you out, you kind of just stick with it. So I keep on, um, I learned a long time ago about GNU screen, which allows you to sort of um, separate a, an SSH session into different tabs that you can switch between with keyboard shortcuts. And I keep on meaning to check out Tmux, which is the the other one, you know, the, the fancier one, the terminal multiplexer, but um, I just haven't quite gone around that corner. It's just like, you know, you know, VI, you feel like you'd never need to learn Emacs or whatever, you know, but um, does anybody use any of these kind of like terminal multiplexers or anything like that? Anything to split your screens or do anything fancy like that? I used to use um, on my Linux machine, I think it was called Terminator or something like that. And you could have several um, terminals open in different like portions of the screen. Um, about the closest that I come to that now is just using the terminal at the bottom of Visual Code Studio and then I split it. In. Right. Or if you're on a Mac, there's the. Um the iTerm too, which has its own kind of cool thing. I'm looking right now, um, thank you, um, Ahmed, for uh, Tylex. I'm looking that up right now, which I have not used. So I'm checking out their page online. And it looks very cool. Awesome. So this is, this is for Linux and uh, it's got drag and drop support. It's got image support, multiple panes, persistent layouts. It's very interesting. Thank you. That's very cool. I will check that out. Guess I'm letting it hang out here. Let's let's see if I got another question in my <laughs> do you, I, I'll tell you when I first um what you know when I first set up a computer there's always like a lot of little tweaking to do um you know you can get work done without all these uh, all these fancy things but then there's certain things that are just the first things you do to set things up to install things does anybody have anything that you always put like in your in your bash rc or your zshrc you know your uh run command file that you always find is one of the first things that you add yeah, power line, exactly that font that that um I use that as well. It's and it's I always waste a, a little bit of time with a new computer setting it up because you know you set it up for your default terminal, but then you've also got to get it so that if there's a terminal in your IDE, it might not work. You know, you have to do a bunch of different steps to make sure it's all set up everywhere. Yeah, I can get a little bit anti-tool that way. Uh, I will put stuff in that like really measurably saves me time or makes something easier like I term and having the uh, like your git branch and get you know like check out status and whatever in colors or in text uh, you know uh, on the on the command line uh, but past that it takes some real doing to get me to adopt a, a tool I don't know I don't I, like I, I don't ever want to have a tool on my machine that I don't use and a lot of my, uh, you know, like my coworkers who are really tool happy, uh, they'll be, uh, you know, looking through their applications for something. And then I, like I hear all the time, oh yeah, I forgot I installed this. I don't ever want to have any of that on my machine. So I'm very slim, you know, very lean with what I set up and what I install. 
uh, I would I, I went down the route of I want to just learn how to use Vim. I want to learn how to use Emacs because, of course, uh, you know our default editor is BI and our default command line interface is Emacs. So you have to you know you have to remember your you know dollar signs and carrots and your control A's and control E's and whatever. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big believer in learning how to use the tools that you have instead of mm -hmm. trying to adopt the cool new thing. Jack, See, off to you on that. BI and Emacs are tough. Whew. I'm a nano guy, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, when 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 you first uh, you, the newbie makes their first Git commit, and and if uh, VI is the default editor on the system, and they don't know how to exit it, there's a, um, a very funny uh, Git repo called How to Exit VI which is <laughs> all of these uh, ridiculous workarounds, including like different ways to um, kill the process, you know, uh, just complicated stuff. You're, you're just supposed to set it on fire, right? I use Nano, so. Right. With uh, VI, anytime I have to, there's like merge conflicts and then VI shows up and I'm like, oh crap. Okay, yeah, same. O N W Q enter. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's what you need to know. <laughs> no, no, no comments on my commit. Just it's blank. <laughs> yeah. I gotta say, I, I'm I'm a dissenter here. I definitely definitely think it's worth the time to learn at least just the the VI basics, just to be able to navigate in it. Because you never know, you know, any system that you end up working in some weird remote system that's a, totally in a weird lockdown environment in some company's private AWS, and like there's nothing on it but VI, you know. And what are you gonna do? <laughs> it's kind of like. Sometimes these things happen, you know, or especially even on the oldest systems, even if you're trying to work on somebody's weird legacy system that's like some old, you know, uh, AIX machine or something, you know, like you, you're bound to find VI support on it. So it's interesting to, it's just a good thing to be able to fall back on just in an emergency, if, if even if you don't use it for a daily driver. We spent a whole semester on it in, uh, in computer science, uh, I don't remember when, but a whole semester just on VI. <laughs> well, maybe that'll turn you off to it if, if you've got to do it. <laughs> I, I want to come back to, I can't remember who was saying this, but the uh, kind of being anti-tool and not wanting to set up your system uh, with, with too much stuff on it and that's, that's not portable. And I think that I've come around a little bit of a bend now, now that I'm starting to use Docker-based tooling like Lando or DDEV or Doxel um, that I want to try and set up each project so that it has the tools that it needs in a way that I can keep it in the Git repo so that it's portable and then it moves with the project to so that anybody can use it, you know? And I find that that's a different sort of philosophy. Um, it's not gonna, it won't install um, powerline fonts on your, you know, on your computer, but it, it, it will allow you to, package up different things that are shortcuts specific to the project that you're working on. And you know you can make custom tooling in Lando or custom commands in DDEV that are gonna have, um, that speed up development for everybody on the team, even the least technical people on the team who would never necessarily sit down and write that stuff themselves. You know, you can make it available to them in a way that's portable. Yep, agreed. That that goes along with my. I want to install the absolute minimum of stuff possible. Uh, we've got uh, a QA effort doing a bunch of Cypress end-to-end -end testing, and it was infuriating is too strong a word, but like the fact that I had to install Node locally in order to run Cypress, I was so frustrated. I was so angry uh, because that now on this machine that is the very first like you know dev tool kind of a thing that i installed locally on this machine everything else is in containers yep yep and when you get into this situation where something has to be on the local machine then as soon as someone else on the team pulls it they have a completely different computer completely different setup different version of node you know and like you got to track down these issues so it's just a nightmare i definitely definitely agree with the philosophy well NVM time and dot NPM RC. Yes. 
Yep. Yeah, I have a, a an old project that we work on and it's on an older version of Gulp. So it it needs like a node version 11 point something. And it's just like every time I start the project and no one's put the the node version requirement in there, it's just like, why can't I get Gulp to work? Oh yeah, <laughs> wrong node version. Yep, and if you ever work for an agency where they've been around for a long time and they have older clients, like even if they are totally up to the minute on the bleeding edge of everything and they're just in the space age with their tooling now, you work on a project for a client that's from like a few years back that just suddenly comes back saying, hey, can you just do this one thing? And suddenly you find you're using Compass and, you know, like things that you haven't heard of in years and like you have to, you know, and I and I, I was in that situation with an agency where the older um, projects, when you check them out, you, they didn't have any kind of um, local development environment bundled with it. You would just have to set it up with like MAMP Pro or something because that was how it was done back then, you know, like, and then there, they, there were a few years where they were using um, Drupal VM with like uh, Vagrant and Ansible. And if you check out those, then that's what you have to use. And then they switched to Lando. So very interesting. I'm the worst at like these lags come. I feel like, is it because I'm talking too much or not asking enough questions? I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> no, I must say going to Lando, which uh, I used it when it was Colorbox. I remember. It had, a I, good, it had the GUI. about those days, yes. Yeah. Um, and, but just, that was just a whole new step of development that I just fell in love with really early on because we could take that project and I could have someone else on the team work on it and set up their own local environment with you know less less knots less yep. roadblocks <laughs> it's the holy grail of the 15 minute onboarding you know you just pull the repo Lando start it installs everything you need even if you're on a slow computer you watch it build one time you know and then it should be pretty fast after that yeah. right, we got one readme file I can tell people just go off and follow the instructions yes and I find myself writing longer and longer readmes with more and more instructions <laughs> which is great because it tells people exactly what to do in every situation so it's good I started building notion pages with toggles and like, okay, so if you're going to be installing the local development for the first time on this project, here's everything you need to do. And this is what your Lando YAML file should roughly look like. And this, yeah. Yeah, I just keep the Lando.yaml file in the project repo and all they have to do is pull it and type Lando start. So they shouldn't have to edit it at all unless they're working on that, that part of things. Exactly, like like bhat. You know, we used to have a default .bhat .yaml, and you would pull it down and do your thing, copy that over to bhat .yaml, and then make your little changes. But now we have a dev environment that is the same for everyone and works for everyone. So there's no boilerplate or template, nothing. Like your config file is your config file. If you follow the instructions and pull it down, it will just work, and that's a that's a game changer. Yeah, and if you and if there are things that would have needed to be copied over from a boilerplate file and hand edited, you can replace those values in that config file with variables that mm -hmm. you're then pulling from like, you know, some uh, JSON object that has all that stuff in it that you need for that environment that may be different from for person to person. So you can just switch it all at once um, and then just have a one file that doesn't change, is it, you know, that's that's sourcing the the whatever you get for your source of your variable data. You know? Yeah. So one, one more point on command line stuff as opposed to dev environment stuff. Uh, and I've been thinking about it for three or four minutes now and thinking how weird it might be to say that I just love to type. So like I find that I don't even RC very much stuff. I don't have, you know, cute little shortcuts like, you know, GP or whatever I'm sure would, you know, saves time or whatever, but I, and, I enjoy typing, like I have, you know, I don't know, I've got cool keyboards and- Oh, who's got the mechanical keyboards? Hold them up, people. Got the mechanical keyboards. 
<laughs> no, you Zoom disappeared completely. <laughs> Mine has a cloaking <laughs> device. That's uh, cool. Now, I had to share this space with my husband, so oh, I have to have <laughs> quiet Mackie. That's a classic. I have one of those two for working at night. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's so like Mackie. <laughs> someone had said something about not knowing how to get into or out of uh, out of VI. I had a coworker at one point sit down at my uh, at my desk, and uh, so I don't. I mean, my, I have a blank keyboard. There's no labels on it, and uh, he just sat down and went. Ugh. And then, so I, fine, I'm like, okay, use this one. Take the Mac keyboard. <laughs> and then he tries to commit something and VI pops up and he, uh, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm rocking a Unicomp M, yeah, Buckland Springs for life. <laughs> An old IBM clone. Very cool. It's super loud, actually, uh, when I worked at Barton at EC Barton and Company, I, I had it there for four years. And my coworkers, when I was gone one day for lunch, replaced my keyboard and told me to take it home. Because it was too loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you don't have to take it home. So I got uh, I got some cherry blue switches and uh they didn't really solve the problem because I was clacking away with some heavy keys. Yeah, I haven't gotten to that level where I actually changed out my switches to see if they have a different, like, you know, what ones are quieter or anything like that. Yeah, they, they, it makes a difference. The blues are my favorite. I bought one with browns just because it was quieter, but it, I didn't like typing on it. Yeah, you got to feel the resistance a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I enjoy a mechanical keyboard. I've uh, I've done I spent a lot of money on some dumb things, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think that was one of them. I've, I'm in that keycap scene, <laughs> custom keycaps and all that good stuff. I've got I got a couple different beaters, but I grew up on a Commodore 64. So what do you expect? Yeah, I was just gonna say my my favorite membrane keyboard was actually the one on my old my, my Amiga one thousand. Boy, what a great yeah. keyboard that was! Yeah, I don't know if there's a you know an RJ eleven to uh, USB C adapter that I could use to maybe dig one of those up, but that would be it feels nice. No, I think you got to use. Well, you're saying to actually hook up that keyboard to a USB. That's right. I'm sorry. Here I was thinking you wanted to emulate an Amiga. Like you wanted to run the old video toaster or something. Oh, I think you can do that in a browser nowadays. I don't think that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you're nostalgic for that specific keyboard, you're going to have to come up with some wacky do adapter. They probably exist. They make one for the Model F, the IBM original keyboard, the F. They make one so that it translates to PS2 or, or whatever the format. But I found that out the hard way. I have an IBM model 5150 from 1981 that's right next to me that I still use. Yeah, there we go. Wow. First modern Model F mechanical keyboard. In 80s beige, too. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, it's turning into the, the keyboard chat channel here. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry. $400. But I don't know if there's anybody who came to, you know, newbies who came to pick up the uh, the, the command line tips. I, I will say one of the first things I always do, and this just goes back to my early, early uh, <coughs> education, was somebody told me that when you first edit your, your bash RC, right, or whatever shell you're using, the first thing that I add is, is an alias called resource, which is just source tilde slash dot bash rc. So that if every time you add something, you just, once you save it, you just type resource so that you get your new commands that you added or whatever. I find that like I do more and more these days customize the the shell, uh, you know, with, with things that are specific to projects that I'm working on. And I also find that aliases just don't cut it anymore. You have to use functions for certain things. Um, if you, you know, you learn shell functions so that they can accept arguments. 
and there's other limitations of aliases. So if, you know, once you get to multi-line logic, you're going to want to have a, a, a shell function, if not a whole standalone shell script, but like you can just put these things in your bash shirk or your z shirk and like have a function way down at the end of it that is for whatever you're working on that like saves some time or, or uh, automates something repetitive, you know? And I find myself making some of these things and kind of putting them in there from time to time. Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time um, getting aliases set up, shortcuts, that sort of stuff. And then, like you're saying, I'm, I get on a new machine and I'm lost again. <laughs> Some people do keep these things like if they if they really, you know, trick out their um, their shell uh, RC files, then they'll just keep them in a Git repo. And, right. and so they move to a new machine and they can do that. Or if there's software that you need to set up too, sometimes people will actually use an Ansible playbook to like run on a new computer that installs everything they need or whatever, you know? So it's similar to provisioning a server with something like Puppet or Chef or whatever, you know? Yeah, um, cool. I haven't gotten to that level, but I worked with somebody. <laughs> I haven't even gotten to the level of committing them to get so. <laughs> right. I have a tendency to try to do so many things from memory, and I'm like, man, if I could, if I could just remember how. Oh, if I could just remember to push this up to a repo, and then use it next time, then I won't have to remember the things that I forget. But. Speaking of memory also, I will say that I am so spoiled now by the Z shell uh, auto completion that if I've typed anything remotely like it, like anywhere in my history, it just kind of guesses what I want to type and I can just hit like the forward arrow enter and just like do it again. So I find like it's probably uh, hurting my ability to form new memories <laughs> where like things that I should be memorizing. Exactly. And you get spoiled with that. Like I'm switching back and forth between, I have Seashell installed on the WSL2 layer on this Windows machine. And, and then uh, I exit and I'm back at PowerShell and I'm like, wait, wait, oh man, <laughs> those shortcuts aren't there anymore. <laughs> I gotta go back to the... Speaking of PowerShell as well, I have just started to learn, um, you know, um, how to set these things up on Windows properly. And I found that the DDEV installation instructions were incredibly helpful for me to finally get uh, WSL2 set up correctly with Docker and all this stuff. Now Lando works thanks to the DDEV readme, you know, Lando <laughs> on Windows. Um, and, and also because of the the hyperdrive installer for uh, for Lando. Now I have a, a decent VI uh, a Vim configuration in my WSL two, so it's all it's all there now. Not that I have to use it hopefully ever, but it's there in case I do. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I I've got to do that. I got to dive in because um, I'm using Lando on Windows side, but it would be nice to use it on the WSL side. Oh, it's so much faster. It's crazy. It's crazy. You should, I can, I'll paste that because it's very, very helpful. Um, okay. I'll, I'll find this. You guys talk among yourselves while I look here for a second. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, I, uh, that will boost my productivity immensely. Here it is. You know, just Google DDEV WSL2. It's the top hit. Okay. But it's it's instructions to set up DDEV local on Windows with WSL2 the preferred way, which is to actually run Docker inside WSL2. Um, and it's just so much faster. It's so much better. And then once you've got that set up, if you follow that, then you can install Lando that way as well, because you just install it, like you go into WSL2 and you install it like you were installing it on Linux. That's awesome. Yeah, because I, I made the mistake of trying to do that the first without knowing about this and ran into the ran into prop obviously ran into problems with it not knowing where Docker was and that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, I ran into such problems with that that I honestly walked away from the whole thing for like probably six months afterwards. I was so frustrated. And then <laughs> I found this walkthrough, which, you know, and I, I, I think, again, that's probably we can thank Mike Anello for, for pointing that one out as well, because he was just that's doing the deep lunch and learns um, with his yeah, team. Yeah, you know, those are good. I think that's where I heard about this one. And boy, within a week, I had figured it out. And it's like, I'm no longer afraid to uh, to do development on Windows, I think I could handle it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I'm about I'm about I'm about seventy five percent there. Not afraid. There's still some things that I miss, but I think that that might actually close the gap and make it easier for me. Um, the the company that I contract for sent me a Windows laptop, and I work on their VPN and all that stuff. And I had previously been using um, Mac OS, and my daily I have. I have a, a Magma Pro that's fairly new, and then I have a home-built Linux machine, and that's what I used primarily for all of my development was either one of those machines. And the 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 switch between Linux and Mac wasn't nearly as I mean I, those are interchangeable for me, but whenever we got to Windows, I was like completely lost. I spent probably a week just trial and error hammering away at this windows machine trying to make it do things that <laughs> out of the box it wasn't designed to do <laughs> and one of those was as soon as i got wsl2 up and running i was like okay there's some familiarity there i can breathe a little bit and so with this that might just be the the linchpin that closes that chapter yeah, I mean, I, I remember back to, you know, um, Windows XP days trying to do stuff with Sigwin or, you know, I mean, there's always been something that kind of purported to give you a, a kind of a shell-like environment, but it never really worked right, you know, because you just, it's just a bunch of Xs, it's a bunch of Windows executable binaries that are kind of juked up to run the same kind of, um, you know, all, all the GNU tools that you can run under, under a, Unix or Linux environment or Mac, which is which is Unix. It's bad. I mean, it's BSD. So, um, but yeah, it just wouldn't play nice with the actual underlying the file system. It's completely different rules. All the ownerships and permissions completely different, um, and you get yourself in trouble if you try to use it. Like you could, you know, try to go and and chmod things or whatever. You know, it just wasn't right. Yeah. Is there anything that anybody always, uh, let me think, I already asked if there, what, what do you always install on a new computer, but are, are there anything, uh, anything amusing that you want to share that's like a, a terminal only thing that maybe people um, don't have access to if they, if they only use their mouse all the time? I'm I'll, 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 I'll show you, I, I, what I'm thinking of here is, uh, I bet I can, uh, let me share my screen because I can do this now. Just ridiculous. And I'm going to make a new my term. Let's see if I can share that. This is, oh no, not end meaning. <laughs> I almost hit the wrong button, share screen, here we go. All right, this one's just silly, but I'm just gonna share this with you. You know, you go to type uh, LS, of course, is, is one of the things that you type all the time every day and you wanna list what's in a directory. But if you type it backwards, SL, you get the steam locomotive, SL. <laughs> I, I just love to just brew install that just to amuse myself. Does anybody <laughs> else have anything like that that you want to share? A little terminal hack that's just amusing? Well, you, you already exposed mine and that was C matrix. Oh yes, let's see, here we go. Brew, install, C matrix. I have not done that on this computer, so let's give it a try. Hope it works. I think it probably will. Yeah. I got a brew update. Got a brew update. Uh, I haven't done this. I get. I don't use this computer as my 
no, usual workstation. Oh, it's getting it. It's getting it. There's a little bit of a, uh, some warnings here because I haven't installed anything in a long time, but it's going to get stuck. Here it goes. This is very familiar to all of us. <laughs> See these things scrolling by. Right. I've got my uh, Raspberry Pi retro gaming, um, uh, like Nintendo thing in the other room. <laughs> when it when it boots up, it looks just like this. It just looks like Linux. <laughs> oh. So I don't know if it's if it's gauche to point back to you know my own talk, uh, but Matt, you said something about running uh, or really enjoying. Uh, Text adventure games like Zork and the like. I, I, I did something at uh, at DrupalCon last year about building a text-based adventure game in Drupal and serving it up through Slack. You are the one who did that. I actually watched that video, and I, I kind of want to return back when I've got a little bit more time and actually play with that. So it's like a mud, basically, or a moo that you enjoyed that was on an old BBS system, right? Yeah. Okay. So you already got it then. That's good. You figured out how to get all of the source code for it, the old C sources, and port it to PHP so that you could use it with Drupal and yet also expose that to the Slack API so people can play it with Slack. Yeah. That's awesome. I, my hat is off to you, sir. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I just, I I just love the type. C matrix while we talk about it. It works. Oh, nice. It's not going to help my productivity. <laughs> Well, this was great. This is fun. I know that we're at the end of our uh, time, so I'm going to head over to the, you know, closing thing. Sure, and I'm going to stick around here until you know, like five or ten more minutes, and head over there myself. Okay. Thanks. Good to talk to everybody. Thanks, yep. Jack. Thanks, everybody who participated. If you got anything else to say? Now's the time. I was just going to say I really enjoyed this. This is a uh... I kind of like the just the free for all discussion on all things command line. It's really uh, it's neat to see what everybody else does, or or at least hear about it, like different examples. Because thanks, kind of a I'm kind of a a, a junkie when it comes to command line stuff. I. Uh, so I mentioned that I had that IBM 5150 PC. It's got a whopping 4.77 megahertz 8088 processor in it, super fast. Um, but I have it hooked up with, a, I have a 10 base T uh, ethernet card in it and it's hooked up to my router and a telnet into my Raspberry Pi with a computer that's 38 year, or no, 40 years old. That's great. And so sometimes just for fun, I'll, I'll tell that into the old Raspberry Pi and boot up like retro Pi or <laughs> whatever, just to see, if, just to see it happen, you know? And uh, I even found uh, there's like, somebody created an ASCII based YouTube player. Oh, wow that plays i'll have to dig that up but it you can play a youtube video like you're doing the matrix screensaver here but it tries to interpret the colors and of the video and and converts them to ascii text so you're just watching a block of animated text that somewhat looks like an image yeah i wonder if that's built on aa lib you can look into that but there's a c header library for ascii art that you can use for video huh. um, they used to have a really cool demo for that that I saw once on Nopix Linux. If you remember Nopix, that was one of the first yeah. um, like live CDs uh, that you could yeah. that you could boot off of. I used so, to use Nopix to fix Windows computers all the time and blow out the super administrator password and one step. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Nowadays, you could get it on a USB key and go in and do the same thing. Right now, of course everybody has a live cd now or a live usb that's based off of the same trick but that was that was early days Klaus Knopper in germany very cool let's stuff let's see here i'm going to share that Oh,
let's go here. Yeah, I've actually got a screenshot of when we did it. I posted in here really quick. Oh, you yeah, know, see it in the chat. It's ended. I don't know. I'll stop sharing them. I can see what's in the sidebar. Yeah, because I couldn't see that before. And here it is. That grainy picture is on my CGA color monitor. That's a picture of my dad wearing a blue wow. shirt. And you can see his red beard there. Yeah, you sure can. <laughs> yep. But this this is uh what all I did to to get my computer, uh, my, my old IBM over there. So yes, technically I was playing YouTube on a machine with 4.77 megahertz of processing power, 640K of RAM. Uh, ironically though, it has a four gigabyte hard drive in it because somebody created a um, IDE, not IDE, um, uh, ISA card uh, that fits in the machine that will accept a uh, compact flash storage device. So when the machine boots up, it takes about a minute for it to allocate free space. And that four gigs of space is divided into two gigabyte, two two gigabyte partitions because it's eight bit and it doesn't, it can't see more than two gigs of hard drive space or something like that. Anyway, it's a, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. It's sitting there collecting dust right now, but every now and then I'll use Telnet on it. There's a Telnet Bitcoin ticker that shows the real time price of Bitcoin. <laughs> and so I use it for that. It just looks cool like steampunk or like, you know, like uh, cyberpunk in the corner there with, with the Telnet, uh, Stick a ticker price of Bitcoin just flashing on an old four color monitor. Great, that's great. All right, well, we got a couple more minutes and we should go over to the other thing. I noticed now, now that I stopped sharing my screen, I missed all sorts of stuff in the chat. Somebody shared uh, a, a link to a terminal that he says is a hipster terminal, but I love it. Add autocomplete and code highlighting, good to go. Um, it's, a, it's a GitHub repository, something called Pure. I was bragging about hyper.is, the, the terminal, <laughs> it doesn't work. I installed it on Windows and it doesn't open. <laughs> I was like, man, I, but I use it on, on Mac all the time. I've never, but I, you know, this machine's pretty new to me. So I was like, well, while I'm talking about it, I'll install it. I installed it and it didn't work. <laughs> all right. You did a good job. Well, thanks. You got, you got some support and you got a lot of interaction. That's, this was cool. Yeah, people like to talk about their stuff. Definitely, it was cool that guy who's doing the, um, the Slack integration with the old uh, multi-user dungeon. That's super cool. I love that kind of stuff. That's just nuts. I feel like Matt Pritchard is talking, but he's on mute because I saw his mouth moving. Oh, no, I'm just saying that. Yeah, it was fun. I just installed SL. <laughs> yeah. You never know when that'll happen. You're just trying to type LS and it goes. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. The story behind that is it's a, well, just read the manual page, but basically it's a professor, a computer science professor from Tokyo who did that to amuse his students in his class. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'll check it out. All right, guys. Well, it's about 4.55. That leaves us uh, five minutes to get to the, the closing remarks or whatever is going on in the other room. So I'm probably going to check out. But uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, that was good. See you Thanks, soon. Man.